Hey, thanks, Barbara, and welcome, everybody. Uh, it's really exciting that so many people have uh, joined the, the meeting uh, this evening. I think it's our biggest uh, turnout so far to date in all of our monthly events, which uh, generally occur on the second Wednesday of every month. Um, tonight, it's really great that uh, Steve Reeser has agreed to come and share with us uh, his deep knowledge of the Maury River. And uh, he's a fisheries biologist uh, with uh, what is now called the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. Uh, I'm sure we all can remember that it used to be called uh, Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. So we have to kind of practice the DWR these days. Um, he's going to share with us some, some really cool video of the Maury, uh, various scientific and other uh, aspects um, that uh, DWR has undertaken under his supervision. And uh, that's gonna even include uh, some information on the Jordan's Point Dam removal and cool things like that. Um, we're gonna have some photographs of uh, various biota, fish, et cetera, et cetera, insects and all, uh, which, are, which will be kind of fun to see and uh, remind us of the uh, rich diversity of, uh, of, our, of our river, actually. Um, Steve has been a, a fisheries biologist for DWR since 1998. He's currently the regional fisheries manager for a 28 county region uh, responsible for overseeing the management of aquatic resources uh, within the Potomac, Shenandoah, Rappahannock, Rivanna, and Middle and Upper James watershed. So Steve's got his hands full. He's got a, a great, uh, a great uh, area to work in and uh, congratulations on, on your promotion. Uh, Steve serves as the agency's uh, statewide coordinator for cold water stream and wild trout management. Uh, his science background is impressive. He has a BS degree in environmental biology from Lock Haven University in Pennsylvania, MS in fisheries biology from Tennessee Tech University, and uh, he enjoys hunting and fishing and paddling and hiking and camping. Uh, with friends and family, and he's a real strong uh, conservationist, uh, so fits right into um, our RAC ethos. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce now, turn it over to Steve. Okay, thanks, Cliff. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank RAC for uh, inviting me to your uh, seminar series here and to share a little bit about uh, what our agency's uh, management activities are on the Maury River. Uh, as Cliff said, you know, we uh, up until July of last year, we were the Department of uh, Game and Inland Fisheries, now the Department of Wildlife Resources. And, uh, our, you know, we, we changed our, we created a new mission statement in 2016. It's to conserve, connect, and protect. You can see there, uh, kind of to reflect more of that we're a comprehensive wildlife agency, uh, kind of catering more to all Virginians uh, and all wildlife, uh, not uh, specifically uh, focusing on uh, uh, hunters and anglers as we traditionally have. So that's kind of a little change for, of, the, of the agency's name as well. And uh, I'd like to, you know, share things about the Maury River tonight. Uh, I'm not just saying this because of, of the group I'm speaking to, but the Maury is my favorite river in Virginia. I've been paddling it and fishing uh, for 20 years and I uh, Hopefully I can continue to do that for 20 more years. A uh, little background on the Maury River here. Uh, it's 42 miles in length. It's a tributary to the James River. Uh, it is in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. It's entirely in Rockbridge County. Uh, it's formed by the Calf Pasture and Little Calf Pasture River. And some of the major towns along the way are Lexington, uh, Buena Vista and Glasgow. Uh, originally it was, an, it was named the North River as, is you know, flowing from the north into the James River. Uh, and the North River Navigation Company uh, operated uh, barge traffic navigation uh, in, in the 1800s from 1851 to 1881. And there were, I believe, over 16 dams on the river at that time. And it was navigable upstream until Cedar, into Cedar Grove, the Rockbridge Bass. 
Uh, and then in 1945, uh, the river was renamed uh, the Maury River after Matthew Fontaine Maury. Uh, and uh, so that's a little background there. Uh, I take this time to uh, kind of show uh, something, a project that uh, the Rockbridge Area Outdoor Partnership has worked on. Uh, Cliff Karakoff and others on a committee uh, charged with developing uh, or investigating more public access uh, to the Maury River. And one of the one of the projects we're working on is developing a new float guide or water trail map. And you can see this is kind of a prototype here that we're, that uh, my agency is leading. Um, we're leading this effort with our GIS uh, staff in, in, in our headquarters office. And we hope to get that map, which is updated uh, with a lot of information out in April and sometime. So, uh, but, you know, while we're on that subject about public access, you know, the, the river is legally navigable. We are blessed to have some public access uh, points to that, to the Maury. Uh, our agency uh, collabor collaborates and partners with uh, localities uh, to, to maintain some of these public access sites on the river. This one is uh, at the, uh, one of the entrances to the Chesney Nature Trail on Stewartsburg Road down to Route 60. Uh, this, this property is owned by VMI and we've had a collaborative agreement there with them for many years to maintain this site for, for river users, to, you know, to enter with boats and, and kayaks or whatever, so for fishing. So. And just, we have, like I said, there was public access up the Goshen Wildlife Management Area upstream of the pass. There's also uh, public access at Jordan's Point Park in Lexington at Glen Murray Park in, in, in Buena Vista. And here we have uh, public access at Locker Landing, which is down near the mouth, near the James. Uh, that you can see here, we have a, we poured a concrete ramp years ago there for, for you know, better access for boats. But, our, our primary focus on managing the river, while everybody, I think, you know, the majority of people like the river is just the, the scenery, uh, the uh, interesting and unique fauna. Obviously, fishing is, is a big interest of our agencies. Uh, here you can see some anglers enjoying a beautiful day on the Maury River. Uh, that's what we're all about. Uh, but then we also have to, you know, remember we have a lot of uh, non-consumptive users or non-anglers here that just like to paddle and enjoy nature. Uh, what the Maury has to offer. And then getting back to our, you know, uh, some of our, you know, maybe stakeholders that we've had that we really haven't addressed as much. And these are for people just like to enjoy nature or our wildlife watchers. They like to get out and enjoy nature. And so we're obviously, you know, managing and protecting the aquatic resources that the Maury River has to offer for, for those folks benefit as well. Um, here's a uh, you know, moving, you know, kind of upstream down. This is in the Goshen Pass up at Parallels Route 39 in uh, uh, Goshen Pass. This is a special area, uh, the headwaters of kind of where the Mari starts, where the, you know, where the calf pasture, little pas calf pasture come together. And, uh, you know, this property, uh, you have the the Goshen Wildlife Management Area, which is Department of Wildlife Resources property. And then you have the Goshen Pass Nature Preserve. I uh, can't remember off the top of my head how many acres that is, but that's uh, owned and managed by the Department of Conservation and Recreation. And this area is unique uh, for its uh, the whitewater uh, kayaking, canoeing uh, opportunities that it provides under certain flows here. This is probably uh, one of the, the most popular uh, whitewater areas in eastern Virginia, uh, like I said, so during certain times of the year. It has class two through six whitewater, um, and, and it has, you know, famous names like Devil's Kitchen. So it, it, that, it's really a, a, a unique, a unique place uh, for that uh, activity. Also in the upper Maury here in the Goshen Pass area um, is one of our designated stock trout waters. Our agency uh, stocks hatchery rainbow brown and brook trout eight times a year in a several mile section of the Maury River. Uh, in that area, it's very popular with our 
uh, you know, we, we're pretty proud of our, our stock trout program. And uh, right now we, we sell probably about 60,000 license trout licenses a year. So the pop, it's, it's, it's one of our more popular programs. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the critters that inhabit uh, the Maury River. And we'll start at the bottom of the food chain and it's aquatic insects, macroinvertebrates. And I'm just gonna run through some of these going from left to right, across and down. Uh, we have crayfish or several crayfish species that inhabit the Maury River. We have uh, helgramites here, which adult uh, form there down below is the dobson fly. There are many species of caddis fly, uh, stone fly, mayflies, and riffle beetles. These are, like I said, at the bottom of the food chain. I missed something there. Uh, we got some other aquatic insects, uh, water boatmen, water striders, back swimmers. Uh, here in the middle is a, is a uh, dragonfly larvae, and then you have an adult damselfly there on the right. Uh, freshwater mussels. Uh, there's a, a lot of people don't realize that we have freshwater mussels in multiple species of, in uh, the James River watershed in the, in, in the Maury River, and particularly in some of the larger tributaries. There's not as many species or the density of mussels in the main river, but there have been seven uh, mussel species documented in the Maury River. Their populations are a little suppressed and, and we can, you know, I can, people can I can take some questions about maybe why that is later on, but I just want to make note here that the two species uh, that are either threatened or endangered and one that is uh, the James River spiny mussel. That's the large mussel there in the, in the upper left picture. Uh, that's of particular interest because it is a federally endangered species. And that brings a whole host of, uh, of, of issues that come along with that. But later in the presentation, I'll talk about some muscle survey work and actually propagation work and uh, restoration work that our agency has been conducting uh, in the headwaters, particularly in Mill Creek up in, on the a tributary of the calf pasture. Also in the morrow, we've got some, uh, some snails, which are grazers that graze on the algae on the bottom. And then down in the lower right here is a uh, Asiatic clam, which is a, an exotic species, but they are uh, throughout the river. Um, and they are a filter feeder like the freshwater mussels. Uh, they're, I wouldn't say they're invasive as some species can be being non-native, but uh, because we do know that there are a lot of critters that like to, to eat and feed on these, these uh, Asiatic clams. Uh, we'll move on to kind of more uh, warm wanted, warm blooded uh, critters here. Uh, this is a river otter. This picture was actually taken by me on the Maury River. I don't remember where or, or how many years ago it was, but the uh, river otter has made a, 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 big, a big comeback in Western Virginia uh, over the last 25, 30 years to the point where uh, there's, you know, their, their population has rebounded enough that now they are fairly common and there's actually an, an open season for, for harvesting them uh, throughout the state. Uh, beaver is another uh, uh, mammal that you, that you may encounter on the Maury River and you're not going to see dams or the lodges that you typically think of with beaver uh, because those are found in the tributaries or side channels more so uh, on, on, a, on a river the size of the Maury, the, the beaver there, they'll live under the banks uh, so you won't, they won't build a lodge or a dam, but you will see their, their activity as far as where they're cutting trees down and, and, and things like that. So uh, other mammals that are common are mink here in the upper left corner. Uh, they're, uh, you'll see them out during the daytime. They, they also will spend time in the water feeding on fish, crayfish, uh, corbicula, um, and, uh, and other animals. And then down in the lower right here is a, is a muskrat, which are, they're vegetarians. They're also quite common. Uh, bird life, there again, this is not a complete list. Uh, these are just some of the more common species that you may see. You know, it's great that we've had a great comeback for, for bald eagle and osprey. Some of the birds of prey that, that are very common along the Maury River now. You've got several species of heron there. And then we've got, uh, you know, cedar wax wings, orioles. Uh, some waterfowl that are common there. Again, there's other migratory and coming through different ponds times of the year, but you've got the, the drake uh, wood duck here in the upper left. So we have a, a female hooded merganser, which is a diving duck, a fish eater. 
and then you've got the Canada goose and, and the mallards, which are, are, are puddle ducks that are quite common. Uh, we can't forget about some of our reptile friends. Uh, here we have a snapping turtle in the upper left. And I'll make a note, I've seen a couple snapping turtles in Amari River that, that actually scared me, they were so large. So uh, there's some very large old individuals out there. And then we've got a painted turtle and a red ear slider here that are two other species that you'll see out sunning themselves on logs and, and rocks, uh, you know, and even in the summertime. Uh, then we've got some frogs, uh, am amphibian species here. We have leopard frog and American toad, a bullfrog, which are not as common as I think they once were. These, I think the populations of these amphibians have declined worldwide, and, and there's a whole lot of speculation for that, but uh, I think that can be said on the Mari as well. And then we've got the spring peeper down here, which is more found in kind of the, the backwater areas, not so much right on the main river uh, in, in the early spring. And I hope nobody's uh, terrified of snakes. Uh, I know if my mother was watching this, she'd be running out of the room right now, but this is a, a Northern water snake. Uh, they're fairly common along the river. Uh, and so they're, they're you know, a common thing to see. Uh, and uh, they often get mistaken for their uh, very, you know, look-alike uh, species, uh, the, the copperhead, which is a venomous pit viper, um, but, uh, and they're also found, you know, in and around the Mari River, but not so much as, as the water snake. So 99 times out of 100, uh, the, the water snake is, is a species that, that, that people encounter. Um, now, talk, uh, I'm a fish biologist, and that's where my area of expertise is. And so I'd like to talk more about the fish species that are found in the Mari River. Here are several, and I'll, like I said, this is not a comprehensive list, but uh, a VMI student did put together a comprehensive list uh, several years ago. There's been 48 different species of fish documented in the Maury River. Um, and these are some of the more common ones that we'll run into as in, in, you see as, in, as far as abundance. We have a fall fish here in the upper left and we have a bluegill uh, and then a black crappie. And then the one, the larger picture here is a rock bass. I will mention that some of these species are non-native, uh, but they are all uh, wild, naturally producing uh, fish, you know, populations in the Martin River this time. Um, here are three other species. One here is uh, the bluehead chub. You can see the tubercles on the, on the blow up there, the, the, the head of the bluehead chub, the male. Uh, this is where this fish gets its name, horn chub or horny head chub. Um, and uh, the picture below that is a, a white sucker. These are the suckers that get fairly large and often school and you'll see them in the pools. And then on the right is uh, an interesting character that you'll find in some, some of the more the swift moving water, particularly in the tail end of pools. It's a Northern hog sucker. And this in the middle of the screen here in the middle of this picture is a, a pile of stones. And they're, they're about the size of large marbles, maybe a little bit larger, maybe a little smaller. Um, that bluehead chub, the male, actually picks up those stones one by one, by one and put, makes it, this is how they make their nest where, they, where they'll eventually lay their eggs. And these chub mounds or nests uh, will become sometimes three feet in diameter, maybe about 24 inches in height. And sometimes when the water level drops in the early summer, you'll see these exposed. They look like somebody dumped out a five gallon uh, uh, pail of, of stones in the river. Uh, but why these are important is other fish species, some of the minnows and dace and darters will also use these chub mounds uh, uh, for their spawning grounds. So uh, there's, that's a kind of a symbiotic relationship there, the importance of that one species to others. Uh, here's the common carp. These fish are non-native. They're native to, to Europe and Asia, uh, but they were introduced in the late 1800s. They are wild and reproduced. There's not high numbers of them in the Mari River, but you'll find them mostly in the deeper pools of the river. Here's some more sunfish, a red breast sunfish in the upper left. It's one of the most uh, abundant species and it's a native species. Below that is a green sunfish, which is a non-native, uh, you know, native to the Mississippi drainage. Uh, the upper right there is a, a yellow bullhead catfish. Um, and then below that is a creek chub sucker, another species we, we often run into when we're surveying. And here's a, a mishmash of other species that are fairly common in different habitats of the river. Uh, we have a common shiner. This is kind of going in the first column down here. 
Below that is a, is a um, long nose dace. And then below that is a white tail shiner. Uh, the the right-hand column, the, the top fish is a central stone roller. And that they get their name because they graze algae off of rocks and move stones around. Uh, then that the, the, the fish with the blue background there is a, is a margin mad tom that is actually in the catfish family. And this is the, uh, the little catfish they get maybe five, five inches in length is the largest one, that, the size they may obtain. And they live under the rocks and they'll really come out at night. Uh, but they are special because they have uh, needle-like pectoral spines on their, on their uh, pectoral fins and their dorsal fin. And it has, has a venom gland there. And if you're pricked by those uh, spines, uh, it, it feels like a, a bee sting. And so, it's, so you need to handle those fish with care. Uh, but they're also a, a favorite food of, of, of predator fish like smallmouth bass. And then the fish below that is, is a fantail darter, which is very common, not so much in the Maury River itself, but, but the tributaries. This next large fish here is a muscalunge or a muskie. It's non-native. Uh, uh, they were stocked in the, in the James River starting back in the 1970s. Uh, they have since naturalized and they're naturally producing in, in the upper James River upstream of Lynchburg. And because of that, they, they do find their way up the lower Maury. Uh, there's no uh, barriers there. And so some of the larger, deeper pools, you may come across a muskie in uh, the lower Maury River as well as this species here, which is a flathead catfish. Again, a non-native fish, uh, native to the Mississippi drainage was found in, uh, was, excuse me, was stocked in the lower James River in the 1970s. Uh, it's since uh, migrated and, and, and occupies now all the way up the James as far as uh, the, the cow pasture and the, the Jackson River. And it too has, will migrate up into the Maury, the lower Maury uh, this fish was captured down near the mouth at Glasgow, and they can get quite large, but they are a, a, a very voracious predator feeding on that. One of their favorite foods is, is uh, sunfish. And then uh, probably the, the fish that our agency and some of our main stakeholders are most interested in are the, is the smallmouth bass. These are two large adult smallmouth bass here. Uh, it's the most popular sport fish or game fish for anglers. Uh, it's one of the most abundant fish in the river. Uh, there again, it's, it's not native. Uh, these fish are native only to the, the Mississippi and Ohio drainage. So these Atlantic Slope drainages like the James River and the Maury, uh, they were not native too, but they were established, uh, introduced back in the late 1800s and they've, they've become uh, naturalized. Uh, and now I'll, I'll share some more data about their populations and some population dynamics in a little bit here. So one thing that, uh, you know, People may ask us as far as our agency, as far as what, what we do as far as protecting or enhancing uh, the aquatic ecosystem of the Maury River. Um, well, we're, we are not a regulatory agency, um, so we have no regulatory authority, but we do work closely with our sister agencies at the state level and the federal level uh, as far as permitting uh, or uh, uh, commenting on projects, whether construction projects, pipeline pro projects, anything that may negatively impact uh, water quality or, or habitat or fisheries. And so that's where we get involved. So we work with these agencies here on, uh, on those issues. But our main, uh, one of our main um, activities is, is monitoring or surveying uh, the fish populations to collect data on their abundance, their growth rates, uh, their reproductive success, their, the, the general health of the fish. And as we use uh, one of our main tools is, is putting electricity in the water. This is an electric fishing boat. Uh, we're, we're used to putting electric current in the water and it stuns fish just long enough that we can get a net on them and get some information. Um, we have since in more recent years gone to uh, and uh, using a whitewater raft because we can go in shallower water. And we've been doing that uh, floating and electric shocking fish on the Maury River at three different reaches in the springtime uh, in recent years. And we'll, I've got some video later on to show about that. But that's so when we collect these fish, we're collecting a lot of information from them uh, length and weight. Uh, like I said, we age these, these fish, we, we, we calculate mortality estimates. We check their food habits or over general health uh, and we get some information. Well, we've 
got really uh, refined in collecting some of this data and on our one of our major rivers uh, we've done some what we call a biomass estimations or population estimates using uh, multiple electrofishing boats here. This is actually down at near Route 60 on the Maury back in 2006, I believe, when we were depleting uh, a reach of river here. We did this at three different reaches. Of these where we would make multiple electrofishing passes through, say, a quarter mile to a half mile reach of river, removing all the fish and holding these in these live tanks until we collected the, the length and weight information uh, for them, and it generates numbers like this. Uh, this is the kind of data. This is for smallmouth bass. So these are estimates. So how you uh, interpret this this graph is from those population estimates that we did. At, say it there at the BMI site around six. We estimated that in 2006 at that time there was almost a thousand smallmouth bass per mile in that section of river. So those are some of the kind of data that we collect. And one thing we're really focused on when we're monitoring these fish populations is the reproductive success, because that's really what drives these fisheries. These are two young of year or less than age one smallmouth bass that were spawned in late May. Probably they were collected here in, in early October. And that's what you know maintains these fisheries. These fish are all probably the same age, so they're from that same year class. So when we have really successful spawns, it really shows up uh with you know good numbers of the, of the size fish that anglers are really trying to target and uh, as i said before some of the other information that we collect to help main uh monitor or, uh, excuse me uh, manage these fisheries or we age these fish here's some major growth information for smallmouth bass from from the mari river they grow fairly slowly not reaching 12 inches till about three years of age and then they flatten out don't grow very much I guess the take home here is that um, uh, they, uh, they do live a long time and a trophy size smallmouth bass. So for most anglers, that's a, a fish that's probably 20 inches in length and over four pounds. That fish is probably a minimum at least 10 years of age, it could be as old as 15 to 18 years. So they do live a long time. And that's where like catch and release fishing, putting those trophy fish back, you can catch them year after year for multiple years have the ability to do that. Um, I mentioned how, uh, you know, really mother nature governs uh, these fish populations. You know, man and anglers really have no impact on them. But I'll talk a little bit about that, about our sort of our krill surveys where there's really not much fish harvest, but it's floods and droughts or, or stream flow or what really drive spawning success. And so this is some data from the James River that just shows whenever we have high high water in June, uh, we have poor uh, reproductive success, poor spawning success, and and it's where we have multiple years like that in a row. Uh, if we have high water that time of year, it can really suppress the fish population, and then my phone starts ringing because anglers aren't catching any fish, and it's not because they can't catch them; it's because they're not there. They were never born; they didn't survive that first year. So. Um, but one thing that we have tried in the past in the early 2000s was to maybe what can we do as managers to augment those poor year classes that mother nature throws our way and one would be supplemental stocking. So here is we, we tried stocking, <coughs> excuse me, smallmouth bass fingerlings are about three inches in length uh, for several years. We did see some decent survival of these fish, but the overall objective was, you know, could we actually maintain a, a population when there was a year class failure or a spawning failure and the jury's still out. We weren't able to stock the number of fish we needed multiple years in a row to test that, but we're, we're planning on doing that in the future at some other rivers, particularly the Shenandoah, uh, because we have uh, a renovated, our uh, Front Royal Fish Hatchery has been renovated and we're going to be raising smallmouth bass there to stock in the Shenandoah River. So what we learned there may, may one day help us uh, uh, do some management on, on the stocking on the Maury River. Um, I mentioned we, we checked the health of the fish and we have a lot of background information, uh, health-wise histology, bacteriology, virology, parasitology uh, on fish from the Maury River because we saw uh, fish health issues, episodes, fish kills in the Shenandoah River, the Cow Pasture River, and the Upper James 
2005 through about 2010. And uh, while we were investigating that, we weren't seeing those same fish disease issues or fish kills in the Maury River. And so we went there to kind of investigate, collect some of the same type of background data to find out, you know, what may be the reason for that. Uh, I, I, I can never really determine, able to determine what was causing those, those problems in the Shenandoah or the James River, but we do have background information now on the, on the Maury going like that type of information every five to 10 years. I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, we're doing some muscle survey work, freshwater mussels. This is uh, some of our staff and some Virginia Tech students up on Mill Creek, uh, a tributary of the cow pasture upstream, uh, upstream of, uh, of Goshen. And uh, they're snorkeling along the bottom, ID, uh, finding mussels and identifying them. And I mentioned that uh, one species that were uh, of concern there is the James River spiny mussel. We're actually propagating these federally endangered mussels in two facilities, one in Southwest Virginia, one at National, or excuse me, uh, Harrison Lake National Fish Hatchery. Uh, and then, and then uh, stocking them, if you will, back out in, in the wild and uh, monitoring their survival. So we're marking these individual uh, mussels with a number so we can, re when we re recapture them, we can check for their growth or, or mortality or if they've made any slight movements. And so that's pretty, uh, a pretty interesting uh, endeavor that, that we're involved with there, particularly, like I said, some sites up in Mill Creek. Uh, but one thing while we're managing the fisheries, we also need to keep in mind, we need to understand what's going on with the anglers out there, you know, What's their satisfaction level like? Uh, are they harvesting fish? You know, what would they like to see with our programs? And so we routinely try to get information from our anglers. Uh, but because of the cost of these angler krill surveys, uh, we haven't, we've only ever done one angler krill survey on the Maury River, and that was in 2004. And uh, we got a lot of good information there about that. I guess the take home here is that there's not an, there's almost 100% catch and release for a lot of sport fish. Anglers are not harvesting fish, so there's really no impacts from angling uh, on uh, our, our sport fish populations. And so that's, that's good information, but we'll, you know, there'll be time and time again that we need, maybe need to go back and collect more of this information, particularly when looking at, you know, the recreational value uh, that, you know, recreational users are using. It just, it's more information to help, you know, make the case for, for developing more public access uh, to, to rivers like the Maury. Uh, now I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, something, some very large stream restoration, uh, riparian restoration projects that our agency has been involved with. These were both down, there are two separate projects here. They were both down at the lower Maury near Glasgow, upstream and downstream of the Route 130 bridge on the Eccles property. Uh, Louise Finger, our stream restoration biologist, uh, led the, both of these projects where we had, uh, I don't have the exact data, but we were losing uh, thousands of <laughs> cubic yards of soil here, acres of ground, the echoes were losing. We, these are what you're looking at here, are vertical banks of about 12 to 15 feet. Uh, this is the first project. So this is upstream, you're looking upstream here of and where that eroding bank is there on the left. Uh, the blue lines are you're looking at old aerial photos. These, this is where the river channel was at one time and, and, and rivers and streams will move laterally over time. That's a natural process, but we wanted to get it back over at that angle. And so it was a huge project it took uh, about, this was I think in, in 2014, uh, took about six to seven weeks uh, one of the largest projects of its kind. Here you can see where the um, uh, river had been. I want, to, want you to look here at the lower right-hand portion of the picture. That is a rock uh, vein there that helps direct the energy away from that bank. There's actually more of those structures downstream there to kind of keep that over there. Uh, this is after a few months later, after we've had a few uh, high water events. And also this is allowing the river access to its floodplain. You can see over there where that, where that little pond is developed. That's, you know, actually, you know, good. To, but you can also see where 
the bed load has been distributed down there. The natural, the river's naturally moving that there and stabilizing the new channel. So this is a very successful project. Like I said, one of the largest of its kind, just in sheer magnitude in, in Virginia. And here's, you know, several months, you can see some more vegetation coming on there and the river's really, really uh, shaping up uh, very stable. And this is downstream of the 130 bridge. This is, or like again, on the Eccles property, losing tons of sediment and soil here. It's all heading downriver into the Chesapeake Bay. We've uh, act sloped back the bank here, given the river uh, access to its floodplain to dissipate energy and revegetated it. And I can say that it's, this is a very successful project and it's very stable now and we don't have a roading bank there. And it's you know, good for, for all the aquatic organisms uh, downstream. Uh, the next project, and I apologize, I'm flying along here at 100 miles an hour, but there's a lot of information, a lot of neat projects that we've been involved with. This is the Jordan Point Dam in Lexington. Um, it's, it was a 10-foot high dam. It was constructed in 1911, owned by, was, what, was owned by the city of Lexington. Uh, it did not pass dam safety inspections in the mid-2000s, and uh, the city of Lexington came to our agency and asked for our assistance to remove this dam uh, because of the liability that they were under. There had, there had, there had been a drowning or two here and, uh, and plus, or just the cost to try to bring that dam back into to safety compliance was, was, was astronomical as you might imagine. So uh, we, uh, Louise Finger, like I said, Spira, this was a, a huge project, much more engine, you know, much more a social uh, experiment as far as uh, when you're talking about removing a dam uh, that's been there for a hundred years or more. Uh, a lot of issues there uh, on the social side, not so much with the engineering and biological side, but this is a photo after the dam has been removed. You can see there, this it was a, uh, a concrete dam. I've got uh, some more photos here. This is during demolition, they, you know, a, a, tra a track hoe, and there was also a track hoe with a, a pneumatic hammer on it. Here you can see just upstream of the concrete structure, there was an old wooden crib dam. And so all this was uh, uh, documented for historical purposes. And that was a big part of, of any kind of dam removal project is going through those, those uh, procedures to document everything uh, for the historical uh, perspective. Here's uh, one of the first paddlers that made it through the uh, breach dam. So this is the first time that that section river has actually been floated uh, in, in 100 years. Uh, I've got some drone footage here. Just, to, you know, you know, perspective that those railroad uh, abutments there, um, those were part of the project were removed. They were not really causing any problems, but they, that was part of the project. You can see the fish ladder there on the right that was was put in with good intentions, but it was never designed right to, to really fu function effectively. Uh, but that was left for historical purposes, as well as other uh, abutments of the dam were left in place. Okay. Here's another video. Like I said, this uh, is another drone. You can see this is after the removal. A while we've had some, maybe a few high water events. We've opened up one point, you know, reestablished 1.2 miles of riverine habitat upstream here that was, was in the impounded part of the river for, for all those years. Uh, the banks have been re-stabilized. There wasn't a whole lot of sediment behind this dam, and I'll talk a little bit about that. I've got another video here to show about that. There you can see the remnants of that wooden crib dam there as the drone flies by. But, uh, but this was beneficial for uh, not so much uh, anadromous fish or, or migratory fish, but resident fish to move upstream and downstream to find spawning areas and uh, just in natural river processes for that river to, to transport sediment and bed load and hydrology. So it's, it's all been a win-win from that perspective. And uh, part of the, this project was also, you know, doing some, this is, I think RAC was a partner, some members of RAC and as well as the Coastal Canoeists worked with Louise and students, I think, at Washington and Lee to do some uh, live stake, willow stake, and other native planting, plant plantings uh, on these banks to stabilize them. And I, 
I can report that that's been very, very successful. This is a video I just want to show, like I said, we did our background here, worked with historical purposes. Uh, we actually helped recover two millstones that were in the river channel. Uh, they, were, they were recovered. Uh, we also did some survey work to look at the amount of sediment that was back behind the dam here. This is our, uh, one of our biologists, Jason Halliker, doing a little scuba here. I just thought I'd share this video. Um, this is in the impounded uh, portion just upstream of the dam. And uh, you can see some, some small, small mouth bass here. Uh, here's a red breast sunfish, one of the other common species. And Jason was even playing around. And here's an elliptio, a freshwater mussel, one of the more common freshwater mussels are found in an area. So just a little look, see there what the underwater will look like in the Maury River. Uh, part of that also, we, uh, Dr. Robert Humston, a professor at Washington Lee University, uh, got some grant money and wanted to look at smallmouth bass movements pre and post dam removal. And so here's a little look at, at uh, the work that was done there. These are uh, radio transmitters were uh, surgically implanted into, I think, 40 smallmouth bass. Uh, here, Jason Halliker is uh, doing, doing the surgery on this fish is anesthetized and we're doing a little suture work here, sewing them back up. And these fish were like were released upstream and downstream of the dam uh, post uh, pre-removal and then post-removal and then tracked by Dr. Humston and his students to look at movements. I'll share some of this data here. Uh, the take home here, these are fish locations. So these aren't all individual fish. These were just different fish locations. And so the take home here is we saw uh, pre dam removal fish removing. One fish moved downstream, swam over the dam uh, and, and no fish actually made it up, upstream of the dam. And the fish that were released upstream of the dam, you can see they moved upstream even past beams bottom. So there was a fair amount of short term short length movement there. And this is the fish post dam removal. So there were 20 more fish that were released post after the dam. We had a few fish swim uh, upstream through where the dam would have been. And then also uh, a few that had uh, come down through where the old dam was and went as far downstream, almost down to the Ben Salem way side. So the take home here is uh, most fish showed limited movement and then some fish, these are little outliers, you know, movers and stayers that make large movements. But generally, most of the smallmouth bass are sedentary and don't travel great distances. That was kind of some interesting information. And uh, no kind of running long on time here, but I'd like to share a video and kind of narrate some of this. This is with outreach that we've done um, with some of our electric fishing work. And I've, I've turned the sound down here, the volume down, but. We posted this on our social media accounts. This was, I think, in the spring of 2019, doing our, some of our uh, wrapped electrofishing uh, upstream there, uh, a lone mill to Beans Bottom, then down another site there below Buena Vista, and then even uh, downstream from, from there down to River Road. Here I'm, we're, I'm electrofishing uh, smallmouth bass or in shallow in the spring. You can see here's a here's a, a, a good size adult, and then we're going to take our lengths and weights. Those are red breast sunfish, the very most common. There's a rock bass. So these are, you know, I'm talking here about just the high densities of these fish, and and what causes that. You know, the good spawning success, and they are the most abundant species in the river. And here we're taking some lengths and weights uh, of these fish that also help us determine their age. We will have to take a subsample of those and age some of those to, to double check. But overall, like I said, this is kind of an education and outreach, uh, kind of a fishing forecast, if you will, for anglers. But here I'm talking about the, uh, those are the, the young fish that aren't quite a year old yet. We're looking for those. And uh, that's important. Here's a, a one-year-old. And I just keep going through the bucket here. Here's a two-year-old just to kind of show a three-year-old, he kind of gets away from me. Um, and then the larger fish that the anglers are after and talk a little bit about, you know, the mortality rates of these and how old this fish might be and how many of these fish this size that anglers may float by or expect to see in a certain reach of river. Here again, these are the, 
the most common sport fish, game fish species, red breast sunfish and the rock bass in the middle there that, that anglers are they're really targeting and what they're gonna catch when they're floating and fishing the Mari River. I'm gonna try to uh, speed this up a little bit here. Like I said, we had two days here of, of these social media posts. Uh, Jason Halliker, that's our uh, other, other fish biologist, uh, just kind of sharing this information with our audience and, and talking about food habits and about fishing techniques uh, this is something we tried to do more and more of, uh, you know, just, you know, educating the public about the biology of, of, of the river and why it's important water quality and those kind of things. There's a, a fish that had eaten a, mad, a margin mad tom uh, and, you know, you just see those kind of interesting things out there. So, Yeah, just like I said, this video together was like seven minutes long. I didn't feel like I could show the whole thing, but it obviously we're going to show some larger fish here to kind of get people excited about coming out and fishing the Mari. And, and we direct people to our website as well as other websites, uh, whether it's, you know, the local chamber of commerce or other NGOs in the area. You know, we're all, we're all kind of partners here and kind of uh, marketing the, the, the natural resources of the Mari River and the surrounding area. So that's kind of it in a nutshell there. Uh, I guess with that, I will take questions. Chris. Okay, I'm, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me, Steve? Oh, maybe not. Let's double check. Steve, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay. I've got a couple of questions. Thank you so much. This is fascinating, fascinating work your, your agency is doing. Um, a couple of questions. Um, let me see. The first one came in through chat. And if anybody else has questions that they want to type in right now, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, the question is, why and how does high water in June impact fish mortality and populations? Okay, well, that's a great question. And it's really, um, th if those fry, those smallmouth bass fry, and all the fish that I showed or talked about, they're all spring spawners. So those, all those fish species, the only fish that's a fall spawner that would be in the Mari River watershed would be brook trout. And they would only be up in some of the headwater rivers. And there's the, so all these, all these other fish, are spawning anywhere from uh, late March for some of the suckers, clear through early June and even into the summer for some of the sunfish. That high water, um, what it does is it pretty much displaces those small fry from their nest. And they're, they're just, they're more open to mortality out of, out of the wild there from predation or just getting swept away. And um, that's, so that's one, they're most vulnerable is when they first swim up that swim up stage from the egg and they're they're only oh they might only be 10 millimeters in length at that time um and so that's and that's in that june period and so we looked at that data uh from the flows and our from the rappahannock the shenandoah and the james river for like we had 15 years worth of data on those rivers and that's those models we built showed that June flows were, were, were the most uh, influential on uh, that spawning success. Okay, our next question, what are the smallmouth populations in the two major source streams of the Maury? Well, um, that's a great question too. We've never really done any uh, uh, survey work on the calf pasture or little calf pasture in recent time. Um, I will say that a lot of those species that we're, that we're showing here are also present in the calf pasture, little calf pasture, but not in the densities or the numbers. Um, and, and also, you know, these fish are, are, are do a little better as you, as you move downstream in that larger, larger water. Um, so, yeah, and we see that in, in the Mori itself. So the densities of smallmouth bass or the larger smallmouth bass 
we'll see higher numbers of those as you move down river. So for say um, in the Rockbridge, Rockbridge bass area, yeah, we're gonna see you know decent densities of smallmouth bass and rock bass, but those numbers are gonna increase in density, just the population size as we move down river toward Glasgow. So when we get downstream of Lexington, those populations really increase you know, maybe, maybe two, maybe three fold. And that's, we see that in other rivers, whether it's the Shenandoah or the James, uh, it's just kind of a downriver phenomenon. It's, things are more productive and the habitat is a little more complex. Okay. Well, while we're up in that part of the watershed, um, I have two related questions that came in with the registrations. Um, the first one is, does the sediment frequently released from the Goshen Boy Scout Dam negatively impact the fish and aquatic insects downstream? That's another great question. Uh, I know there were some issues with that many years ago um, from, from release from you know, Lake Merriweather Dam there. Uh, th those have been alleviated somewhat because of, uh, you know, they actually built an emergency spillway there at that dam. And so they didn't have to release water um, through the dam like they had in previous years. So, um, but how that can neg negatively affect, obviously uh, all these fish uh, require those, you know, sediment free little interstitial spaces in the stream bed for uh, laying their eggs, a lot of them. And, uh, and as well, the, a lot of those aquatic macroinvertebrates and insects require those sediment-free interstitial spaces for their survival. So you have heavy sediment loads that obviously can smother those, those habitats that are necessary for those aquatic macroinvertebrates as well as spawn. And then, you know, if fish have spawned and there's eggs on this, or uh, obviously if you have sediment that comes in there and covers them, it's going to you know, suffocate them. So that's another negative there. Um, and then turbidity, you know, when you get fine sediments, you know, colloidal soils or whatever, uh, they're actually going to um, uh, prohibit uh, sunlight, you know, from, you know, from photosynthesizing and, and some of the attached algae and stuff that's the, the, really the, the bottom of the food chain uh, from growing. And so that's, that's where, if you have very turbid water, for long periods of time, that can also be a, a negative. Okay. And can you comment on what the uh, public access um, and the status of that um, Lake Merriweather Dam are? Okay, uh, great question. The, you know, our department, Department of Wildlife Resources, we, we were leasing, we had a lease agreement with the Boy Scouts uh, to uh, open Lake Merriweather and some adjoining properties to hunting and fishing. That was a three-year uh, agreement, a lease agreement. Um, that was not renewed this past year. So currently there is no public access again to Lake Merriweather uh, or uh, the Boy Scout property that adjoins our wildlife management area. Um, I don't know what, what the future is. I've, I've heard some, some rumors that you know, financially, the Boy Scouts are are are, are not in not in good a good situation there. Um, certainly, you know, we would our agency would would uh, be interested in in anything we can do to help open up public access to that property into Lake Merriweather. There's not very much uh, flat water, if you will, in uh, in this in this part of Virginia. Uh, so obviously, if we could open that back up to the public, because it was a a a, a pretty good. Uh, fishery for, for species like crop and, and largemouth bass. Okay. And here's uh, somebody who's asking um, whether, uh, what is the safest place for fish to live in the Maury River? And does that maybe depend on the species? And I wonder if you could actually also add uh, some comment on um, the uh, PCB uh, restriction uh, for fish in, in you know, in parts of the Maury. Okay, uh, yeah, as far as safe, uh, there again, all, yeah, of, the, of those 48 species that, that I mentioned, or, you know, some of those, they all are gonna prefer different types of habitat, whether that's depth and velocity of water. Um, and, you know, you have a natural pool ripple run 
habitats um, throughout the entire 42 mile length that's, you know, some of those fish are gonna prefer the deeper, slower water pools. Uh, some fish are gonna prefer those ripple habitats. Uh, just the same goes for some fish that prefer the smaller water, the tributaries, because of the temperature may be a little cooler there. But uh, to address your question about the PCBs, um, yeah, there, there's a uh, fish consumption advisory uh, for uh, consuming fish uh, from uh, the Vontex Dam downstream for PCBs. And it's just, it's not a ban, but it's, it is a, uh, it's not an advisory. This is, this is determined by the Virginia Department of Health, not by our agency, but we will assist uh, the Department of Health in collecting fish for, for tissue analysis for contaminants. But, uh, and I'm, I'm not an ex expert on the contaminants and how long they'll persist in the environment, this kind of thing, but there is currently a, a TMDL uh, that's been in, it's been initiated for uh, addressing the PCB issue in the Mari River and 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 the James River, and uh, our agency will be involved any way we can with uh, assisting with that TMDL project. Uh, I, I I do know that from a physiological standpoint uh, that PCBs uh, they're not affecting the fish in any way. Physiology, it's more of a human health concern. You know, you, you can't have contaminants that if they get at high enough levels in fish can, you know, neurologically or, or physiologically can cause problems with fish as far as reproducing or behavior, uh, growth, those kind of things. But uh, I'm not aware that, that, uh, that our levels of PCB or other contaminants are high enough that we'll be seeing any of those effects on fish in the Mari. The Mari, you know, they've got their share of parasites, parasite loads, which are natural, some are natural. Uh, but uh, by and large, health-wise, comparing fish in the Mari to, say, the main James River or the Shenandoah or the New River, uh, fish in the Mari are, are, are pretty clean. Uh, and, and I would say uh, on, a, on a health scale from 1 to 10, they're, they're up there, you know, 8 or 9. That's, you know, like I'm not a fish doctor, but that's, that's an <laughs> assessment. Okay. Um, I've got just a couple of more, if you're willing to stay on another minute or two, um, if anybody else has to, to leave, because uh, we are reaching the eight o'clock hour here, please feel free to do that. But Steve, would you be willing to answer just a couple of more? Um, the first one is just a quick number. Um, do you have, do you know offhand how many public access sites there are on the South River tributary to the Maury? I, I, yes. <laughs> I believe the answer is zero. Okay. Uh, the, <laughs> it's a nice round number. <laughs> property there uh, off the Chessie Trail that I believe where the, where, the, where the bridge is being constructed to cross South River that it, the VMI has uh, ownership of um, that would be, and, it, and that is just upstream from the, the mouth of, of, of uh, South River. Um, other than that, not until you get up stream where I'm trying to think of if there's any national forest that borders the South River, you know, large uh, section of the South River upstream that is stocked with uh, trout by our agency. Mm -hmm. Sure, if there's any national or excuse me, national forest up there. So, so the answer would be uh, I don't believe there's any public access on the South River other than maybe right of the uh of an the, opportunity uh, yeah there's an opportunity, an opportunity yes <laughs> two more um real quick um first of all uh could you just kind of give a broad uh general statement about what you see as the greatest ecological threats to the mori in the coming years well that's a that's a great question because i don't or see, and I'd have to look at, you know, Rockbridge County's plan, if you will, development plan or comprehensive plan, you know, unless you saw large scale development, uh, you, uh, you know, large human population increase in the watershed, obviously when you do that, you're bringing on added uh, waste uh, and, and, and po other pollutants and things. And I, I'm not, I don't really foresee that from, from what I, from, from my, from my perspective, um, probably, 
you know, climate change is another a big issue, and uh, and I don't I think if we see impacts from that, the, the the first ones we'll see will be in our headwater streams, and it'll be temperature related. So these will be cold water species like trout, brook trout, or other species that rely on cold water. We may see the impacts there, but there may be other subtle impacts. You know, subtle impacts. Uh, from increased temperature, just one or two degree of temperature change, even downstream in the main Mari may uh, give an advantage to a, a, a parasite or some other, uh, mm -hmm. and then, you know, something there that could cause problems. But um, the other thing that, you know, comes along with climate change is, is the, the in, intenseness, I guess, in weather events. So when we have storms events, they're more intense. Uh, there's more frequent, frequent there. So the, the, the water flow, the stream flow may be more irregular than it ever has been in, in, in many, many years. And that's where if we have more of those frequent high flows uh, during the spawning time for a lot of these species, it could impact them. And if, if you have enough dramatic impacts there, uh, it could really suppress the numbers uh, abundance wise of these fish. So thing I like to mention, we talk about potential impacts that are unknown or unforeseen that can have the greatest impact in a short period of time are introduced species, a non-native species. So I talk a lot about some of these fish species here that are non-native, but they become naturalized and they really haven't been invasive or that we can tell, uh, but there's always that chance. We see it uh, in the terrestrial world, whether it's gypsy moth, whether it's a wolf, hemlock woolly adelgid, now the emerald ash borer, where you have some, some invasive non-native uh, insect species or pests that have really, you know, the chestnut blight, another one, you know, American chestnut blight uh, from you know, 20th century. Um, they, they, that's, that's my biggest fear as a, as, a, as a biologist, where we, you know, you have unintended uh, introductions of invasive and it's beyond, it could also be, you know, I hate to say it, but like, like uh, the COVID-19, the pandemic, if there could be a, a introduced fish virus that just affected certain species of fish that came in from other fish that were transported from some other part of the world, um, that could be devastating. So that's why we encourage and we educate uh, our stakeholders not to move fish or other species around from body of water to body of water. Uh, not, not because you know, we're concerned about it. Well, there's two concerns. One is, are we introducing a species that's, that's not native there and cause problems, or are we introducing a uh, pathogen? Mm. That's where uh, it's not, it's, it's also illegal to uh, uh, release any fish or aquatic organisms into waters of the state without authorization from, from our agency. So that's kind of my, 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 uh, stump speech there on, on being, being careful with uh, moving around fish or, or even water. I mean, that's where we tell people to drain their boats. Uh, so, you know, you know, you're kayaking or somewhere in the New River or a different watershed, say you're in, 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 in Missouri or Arkansas, and you, bring, you could bring a pathogen or, a, or, or a aquatic insect or something that's non-native to, back to Virginia and the Maury River. And you know we have a an invasive uh, algae, a didymo in the in the lower in the Jackson River tailwater, that uh, that there's speculation that's moved around by by fishermen. It lives on their their, and they move it from water to water. So that's where we ask people to clean, dry, uh, you know their 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 boats, their fishing equipment from from we're moving from one watershed to another. That way we don't we we reduce the risk of introducing. Uh, uh, pathogens or other unwanted critters. That's good to know. Uh, final comment and a question combined here, and then I'll turn it over to Cliff to wrap up. Um, Kevin says, this is great. Thanks to Steve and Rack. Is there data that local anglers can report to Steve or others that would be helpful? That's a, that's a great uh, question. And, and I talked about us um, wanting information from, but it, 
we're getting into the realm of, of using social media and other vectors to collect an information via the, you know, the traditional krill survey or angler survey is, you know, we're walking up to an angler that's floating by or, or staying along the river fishing and we ask them a bunch of questions about how long they've been fishing, what species of fish they fish for, how satisfied are they, uh, how much money have they spent on their fishing trip today, those kind of things. And, uh, but those, those are pretty labor intensive to do. And so we're really reaching out, looking at different novel ways. And it's, it's maybe angler diaries where we actually ask anglers to record their, their fishing trip information and then provide us that at the end of the year. Uh, you know, we're using remote trail cameras to kind of get a sense of fishing pressure at our, some of our access sites, uh, you know, counting anglers and, and river users. And so, the, the, you know, there's, there's gonna come a, a, a day when, when we do reach out to anglers to ask them to provide that information. So uh, that, that's coming. <laughs> great, great. Okay, um, well, thank you so much, Steve. I'm gonna turn it back over to Cliff to wrap up. And uh, uh, just a word to everybody else, um, if any of more questions are coming in as we're finishing here, we'll um, try to, uh, we'll ask Steve if he'd be willing to uh, uh, answer them in writing and then we'll send those out to the, to the group that registered. Cliff? Well, thanks so much, uh, Steve. It was just fabulous uh, uh, presentation and it's just great to have such a, a deep science base uh, presentation. Uh, it was like going to school for me, uh, like uh, in a biology okay. or class or something. It was really great and inspiring. And it was also great to hear from you that the health of the river is pretty good. Like you said, maybe eight or nine compared to uh, other rivers. So that, that should make us feel great and also inspire us to uh, uh, stick with conservation and uh, do our best uh, to uh, protect and preserve uh, the river. Um, I would say, uh, just looking to the future here uh, of our lecture series, um, it's every Wednesday, the second Wednesday of the month, usually. And our next one uh, in March, March 10th, uh, will be on composting. And then in April, uh, our second Wednesday presentation will be on um, plastics uh, and uh, the issue of plastics and plastic pollution in the state of Virginia. Maybe we get into some microplastic issues with respect to uh, uh, water uh, as well. And then uh, we'll wrap up in May for the summer. Uh, we'll wrap up in May with a presentation on clean energy. And then we'll start up again in September and we'll organize uh, again uh, a monthly schedule, second Wednesdays, uh, beginning in uh, September. So I want to thank everyone for coming. And uh, it was just uh, really, really great to have Steve. He's a, he's a great guy to work with. I've enjoyed uh, knowing him and working with him uh, over the past several years. And uh, uh, he leaves us with a very positive, I would say, uh, uh, feeling about, about our river. Uh, and uh, so thank you again, Steve. Uh, and thank you everyone for coming. And uh, we'll okay. see you uh, in the future. <laughs> well, thank you, Cliff. And uh, just want to say, you know, I uh, thank thank I thank Rack again for all you all your organization does. Like I said, it, it, I think your mission and values align with our agencies, and that's all a win-win for for the aquatic resources in Rockbridge County. Uh, you know, that's you know we have it's, it's there's a lot of unique um, special resources there. The Mari River being being kind of the, the main focus, um, but uh, appreciate all that RAC does. And again, thank you for inviting me tonight. And if uh, just, I just might say that, uh, you know, for please, if you have any questions, uh, want, want me to provide any data or any more details on some of those projects and programs I talked about, you know, you can reach out to me by email um, or visit our, visit our agency's website uh, there's a lot of information there, and we we have plans to, you know, more, uh, outreach as far as with social media. Uh, we're we're trying to really ramp that up as an agency. So, uh, but we, you know, appreciate all the interactions that our agency have had with with RAC.
to continue that in any way we can in the future. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Steve. Good Thanks, night. Steve.